for this lab, you'll be mixing reagents to determine if they are aqueous in solution or if a precipitate forms. So a solution consists of a solute and the solvent. In all these cases, the solvent is actually water, so it's an aqueous solution. So here are just some of the aqueous solutions that you will be mixing together in some combination to see if they react. And some of the ways they will react is by forming a precipitate. You should see a solid in the test tube. They could form a gas, so you'll see bubbles. In some cases, you may have a smell, so make sure you slowly waft any odor into your nose. You don't want to stick your face into the test tube. And also, the evolution of heat. And sometimes when you mix uh, two reagents, heat can get evolved, or uh, the test tube can actually become cold. If it's cold, it's an endothermic reaction. If it's hot, it's an exothermic reaction. If you mix an acid with a base, particularly a strong acid with a strong base, uh, you'll actually feel the test tube becoming warm. So those are some of the, what we call the qualitative aspects of uh, reactions involving aqueous solutions. Again, these are all solutions that are dissolved in water, so they are aqueous. And we will see when we react with uh, them according to the table, uh, the type of products they produce. Products could form a precipitate or they may stay in solution. So for this particular experiment, you're going to want to have your solubility table handy. So first thing that you want to do is you want to just estimate one mil. So to get one mil, take a 10 mil graduated cylinder and just now since this is qualitative instead of quantitative um, we don't really have to concern ourselves being so analytical so this is about one mil I'll pour it here and this is just water what I'm trying to do is trying to set the one mil mark so that is about one mil so if you have a sharpie bring it to the lab uh, or we have these uh, uh, pencils that you can use to just mark where the one mil line is at. Okay. And I'll do it one more time on that same test tube. So about another one mil. And I already have my one mil mark. And now I will have my 2 mil mark. Let's see if I can try to zoom that in here. So my 1 mil mark, and this would be my 2 mil mark. Here's my 1 mil, and here's my 2 mil mark. So, you know, we don't have to be so accurate or analytical. We are just concerning ourselves with an approximation. So now that I have my 1 mil mark and my 2 mil mark, I can dump this out. Alright, and now I'm ready to add one mil of one reagent to another mil of the other reagent utilizing these plastic disposable pipettes. So you can use your table to know uh, what to react with what. So as you are mixing these reagents one mil at a time, don't forget to fill out your solubility table or this type of matrix. So you'll have one mil in this case of NaNO3, and that will react with one mil of NaBr sodium bromide, one mil of sodium sulfate, one mil of sodium hydroxide, and then one mil of sodium carbonate. So record your observations here, qualitative as possible, color, smell, evolution of gas, heat or coldness coldness of the external features of the test tube. So that is essentially what you want to record here. Be as descriptive as possible. If there's no reaction, you can write no reaction. But you want to be very good at describing what you actually see uh, when you react these um, reagents. So that completes 
ammonium nitrate, you'll do the same thing with barium nitrate, reacting with sodium bromide, sodium sulfate, sodium hydroxide, and sodium carbonate. So like that, you'll complete this table, looking for precipitate, color, bubbles, heat, or cold. For some part of this experiment, you'll be asked to use a centrifuge. So let's show you how to do that. Um, one of the reactions you'll do is two molar sodium hydroxide. Remember, M stands for moles per liter, that capital M. It's a unit of concentration, two molar. And that will react with 0.2 molar. This is called nickel nitrate. So let's do this experiment here. So I already got my one mil line and my second one mil line that I measured with a uh, pencil. So I'll put 0.2, or excuse me, 2 molar sodium hydroxide here up to that line. Okay. And then I will react that with the 0.2 molar of nickel nitrate. So fill that up to the second line. And you can see here that when I join these together okay, and mix them, so when you mix it, you want to have this tapping action. That gives you a nice, that gives you a nice uh, mixing of the two reagents. So you can see here that I have a greenish, globby looking precipitate. So if I want to isolate that precipitate, I would use a centrifuge. So that's one thing you'll be using um, in this experiment, uh, the centrifuge, for situations that have um, a precipitate. So let's centrifuge the product that we got when we mixed 2 molar NaOH with 0.2 molar nickel nitrate. To do that, you'll need to use a centrifuge. These will be stationed at the ends of your lab bench. The most important thing that you want to do when you utilize a centrifuge is to get this balanced, okay? So when you balance it, I take a blank test tube, hold it, and we will balance it with water. So. Just balance it by making sure they have the same volume. And when they have the same volume by I, the same height by I, you notice these two have the same height. This is my blank. This is my reaction that formed a precipitate. Now they're ready to go into the centrifuge. All right, so to put the centrifuge in, make sure the blank is put opposite to the opposite hole as your sample. Now, if you're going to work with groups, maybe one group will have one reaction and then the other group serves as a balance. Or if you don't have another collaborating group, you can use water. You can use water as your uh, balance. But what you need to do is make sure that they are opposite to one another and they are the same um, weight. In this case, they're going to have the same volume. So this centrifugal force will balance out this centrifugal force. So if they don't balance, uh, your test tubes and the material inside the test tube will actually fly out and it could be a very serious uh, hazard. So there's going to be a switch right here and you fill that switch and the precipitate will collect. Okay, this may be very loud, but that's okay. You want to do this for about one minute. Let's say one minute has already elapsed, so I'm going to turn off this switch and let this stop on its own devices. Don't try to stop it with your finger or don't try to stop it with a paper towel towel, just let it go and stop on its own. So it's a high centrifugal speed 
that's going to collect the precipitate. Um, there's going to be different centrifuges in and around the lab, so make sure you find one that fits your test tube. Okay, so some test tubes um, are going to be a little bit big and wide. Some test tubes are going to be long and slender, and they will fit to different centrifuges. So I found test tubes that fit the holes or the holders of this centrifuge. And now here you go. There is my precipitate. Okay. And the stuff on top is what's known as the supernatant. So this stuff um, is something that I may want to collect, I may want to weigh, I may not do whatever I need to do according to the protocol. So this is how you collect your precipitate using a centrifuge. Once again, find the centrifuge that fits uh, your specific size of the test tube. Just one quick reminder on waste collection. You will amass a lot of waste when you're doing all these reactions and filling out those tables. So it would be a good idea to get a waste beaker and just pour your waste into the waste beaker. Okay? And then take this to the sink and wash it um, using tap water and then some DI water. So then you have a waste collection beaker that you can put into the collection dispenser that's located in the fume hood in the lab. One thing you don't want to do is you don't want to, by cleaning your test tubes, cleaning it with DI water and then putting it into the waste. Okay, we don't want to amass a lot of waste because that's going to be expensive to the university. So the best thing to do is have one standard waste beaker. It could be 250 mils or 100 mils. And do your reactions, pour them in, wash it in the sink, do a DI rinse in the sink, and then clean and dry them. But if you're going to have a lot of DI water waste along with the waste collection you've done with all these reactions, um, it's going to be real expensive for EHNS, Environmental Health and Safety, to come in and remove those. So this is just more waste minimiz minimization and being uh, kind of environmentally friendly. So that's just a, a kind request that we'd like to do with regards to uh, waste dispensing. Minimize your waste at all times and minimize adding water. Do all your washing in the sink. So part two of this experiment involves looking at acids and bases and specifically looking at litmus paper. Okay, you have red litmus paper at your disposal as well as blue litmus paper at your disposal. One thing you want to recognize or one thing that I have learned is that um, basic is blue, okay? Basic is blue, and um, red or pink is acidic. So to that precipitate, I've added about 20 drops of HCl. That is at 2 molar, so this is 2 molar HCl. And I've added 20 drops to that, and you notice that my precipitate has dissolved. So what is the pH of this? Is it going to be in the acidic range or in the basic range? So to do that experiment, you're going to take your litmus paper, either blue or red, okay? And this litmus paper is just a strip of basically pH paper. So get a piece of litmus paper out and then just add one drop. You don't need um, to swap it, just add one drop, and you notice that when I added that one drop, that blue litmus paper has turned to red, or kind of a pinkish red, all right? So that means that it is acidic, okay? So if you see a blue color, think basic. If you see a pink color, think acidic. So that is what I did when I used blue litmus paper. I can do the exact same thing um, using red litmus paper. Okay, so I'll let you guys figure out how to do that for part B. So in conclusion, one of the most important things about this lab is being very qualitative in your observations. So be kind of like a detective and report whatever you see, particularly with regards to color or smell Okay, you just smell it very, uh, like a waft, and evolution of gas or heat or coldness of the test tube. 
Now, another important thing is this concept of molarity, which is a measurement of concentration. Okay, this big M stands for a molar, and it also means moles per liter. So M is moles of solute per one liter of solution. And solution is nothing more than solute plus solvent. Usually in general chemistry class, the solvent is water. So with our solvent as water, we have aqueous solutions. So there's a difference between 0.2 molar and 2 molar. Let's just pick a chemical here, NaOH. Okay, 2 molar NaOH is obviously more concentrated than 0.2 molar NaOH, sodium hydroxide. But they have the same meaning. Okay, this will be 0.2 moles of NaOH per liter of solution which is NaOH plus water. This would be 2 molar NaOH, okay, molar, 2 molar NaOH is 2 moles of NaOH per liter of solution, which contains NaOH plus water. So 2 molar is more concentrated than 0.2 molar, and uh, the flip side, you can say 0.2 molar is diluted, a diluted version of 2 molar. That is, I took 2 molar, added some water to dilute it, to get its concentration to 0.2 molar.